and uh, I think it's working. So um, thank you very much. Uh, today is the 20th of January, 2014, um, and uh, um, um, Annika and Peter are interviewing uh, Captain Alan Domas. And uh, perhaps we could start with a question. How did you come to be Captain Domas? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in uh, Canada, uh, in the 1970s, uh, Transport Canada had a variety of uh, certifications uh, for captains. Uh, there could be uh, captains, minor waters, uh, home trade, foreign going. And so each one had a different requirement uh, you had to put in. And uh, because I worked for the Port Authority and only worked in the river, uh, the only sea time I could gain was uh, what was called minor water sea time. And so I put in my 365 days of minor water sea time, had it certified by the, uh, uh, my employer, the Fraser River Harbor, Harbor Commission, and then uh, went to Vancouver Community College, which was Vancouver Technical Institute in those days, vocational institute in uh -huh. those days, and uh, through a three-month program of um, navigation, shipmasters, business, communications, became a minor waters captain. Okay. Now, working for a port authority, uh, you run into a lot of captains, uh -huh. and most of them are foreign-going uh, deep-sea captains with tons of experience, largely with uh, large ships going in and at large ports. And so when you get introduced as captain, they immediately ask for what ships you served on and what lines you served on. And so I would always mumble under my breath, it was a minor waters, and it didn't, and, and they <laughs> kind of didn't hear me, we'd shake hands, have a glass of wine, and move on down the road. And so it was, uh, it was all very interesting in that um, while I was certified, sorry, Transport Canada, uh, gave me the ability to uh, navigate any of the ships that came into the river. Okay. In truth, anybody who had any brains wouldn't let me do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> the short story. Okay. Well, that's yeah. great. Um, you you uh, you grew up in uh, in Queensborough, mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, so perhaps we could could just ask you to reflect a little bit on what. Uh, what time period that was, and and um, and what kind of place Queensborough was in general, and then we'll move from sort of more general ideas about Queensborough to its relationship to the river during that time. Okay, so just, just Queensborough. So Queensborough, uh, in the uh, nineteen, uh, I actually lived in Queensborough from nineteen fifty when I was born till nineteen seventy three when I got married, and uh, over that period of time. Yeah, there were two sort of landmark uh, events, uh, one landmark event that happened in that uh, in 1950, all of the road traffic to New Westminster was over what is now the uh, SRY Railway Bridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was always uh, interesting as a kid, uh, you had to be home by 3.15 because the parents were a little bit concerned about traffic in those days. And so we lived at the corner of Ewan Avenue and Saint, uh, and Lawrence Street, which, um, as I can estimate, is probably a kilometer or more from the Queensboro Bridge. And um, if you remember the Queensboro Bridge in those days, this was before restrictions on navigation. So if uh, an incoming high water uh, happened to coincide with four o'clock, they would simply open the bridge and let uh, the tow go through. And uh, in the north arm of the Fraser River, you could tow up to 36 sections of log. And each section is 66 feet long. So you do the math and you get something about 2,000 feet long. In the 50s, the tugboats were, a big one would have 150 horsepower, not the thousands you see today. So they were sort of going at one knot faster than the current. So the bridge could be open for 30, 40 minutes. And so the traffic would line up on Ewan Avenue uh, to Johnson Street, to Pembina, to Campbell Street, to Lawrence, and would keep going and would often get as far as Ryle Park. And um, my father was actually convinced that the owners of the Queen's Hotel built it at its current location because that was the end of the line. And guys could get out of line, turn around, and get back to the pub and have a few beers before going home. <laughs> but... Um, it was a very, um, it was almost a small town feeling within a small town. Uh, we went to school 
with um, kids that were parents of Chinese immigrants, of Japanese immigrants, of Portuguese immigrants, Italian immigrants, uh, some Middle European, uh, some Russians. And so we grew up very homogeneous in that uh, everybody was equal and the, the key in uh, between kids was who could kick the soccer ball the farthest, who was the best uh, batter in baseball, or could they catch and throw the cross ball. Mm -hmm. I was not good at any of those and so when you did the uh, uh, first cap and second pick and all that kind of stuff, when they got to me uh, playing baseball, for instance, it was always the 15th left fielder. So <laughs> I think in the entire time I was in elementary school, I got to bat once, and that's because the rest of the kids are going on a field trip or something. I don't know what it was. <laughs> oh, it was just a, it was a, it was a really remarkable place in that uh, everybody knew uh, everybody. And, um, and it was still very agrarian. I mean, we were one of the few families on the block that didn't have chickens. Um, I'm not sure why, but uh, I'm glad we didn't because whenever we had to go to a friend's house and they were sent out to get the eggs, uh, they'd just run in there and the chickens would raise hell and I'd sort of hide in the back. But afterwards we then, uh, because Queensboro was lots of peat, so after the chicken eggs were picked up and you were bored, you'd all climb on the roof of the chicken pet coop and just jump off and see how big a hole you could make in the grass by jumping into it and was wet. So we were entertained by very small things. <laughs> uh, but uh, my, some of my memories are just watching uh, the, some of the Indian families, uh, East Indian families, where uh, they had started living um, as nuclear families extended nuclear families and uh, watching how each person had their role and uh, I always thought it was fascinating um, one of them living on Wood Street uh, the grandfather would take the family cow and uh, walk past, past our place to a BC Hydro right-of-way mm -hmm. and he would let the cow pasture in the right-of-way and he'd sleep there all day and then as he watched the uh, lineup of cars grow he knew it was four o'clock so he'd take the cow and he'd walk back down to Wood Street so it was just, uh, you, would you know, things you would just never see in Queensboro uh, or any New Westminster anymore. It was just amazing. And then uh, things like Spagnell's store uh, at the corner of Ewan Avenue and uh, Pembina Street uh, were the center of the universe. It never occurred to me that people actually went to New Westminster to shop until I was perhaps, I don't know, 10 years old. And my mother uh, took me to Safeways on 10th Street. And uh, I thought, oh. There's more than one grocery store because uh, in, in Queensboro, Rocco Spagnol did everything. Um, when my uh, folks split up, my godmother uh, was our housekeeper. And uh, so one day she said to me, go down to Spagnol's and see Clarence. He's the butcher who lived across the street from us and uh, get the bag. So I went, oh, do I have to? Because it was about a four block walk. And, it was a long way. So anyway, I, I get down there and say to Clarence, saying, Gullo wants the bag, and he goes in the back and comes out with a gunny sack. It sort of weighs about five or well, give me six, seven pounds. And I go, oh, God, what's in there? So I open the bag. Wouldn't you know it? Pig's head. She's going to make head cheese. So I thought, oh, okay. So I start heading home. And uh, before I get home, I run into a kid, and he goes, what you got in the bag? I go, he goes, holy crap! So rather than going straight home, you end up going down Boyne Street like the Pied Piper, collecting kids. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the only piece of reason I say that is that I think it's in the genes, because if you fast forward uh, 30 years, uh, my stepbrother had sent a halibut home with me, and I was in the basement hacking it up into steaks. My oldest son came in, he was in grade one, and he sees this huge halibut head there. And I said, look at that, two eyes on the same side of his head. And he goes, wow. And he says, uh, it's my turn for show and tell tomorrow. Can I take it? And I said, okay, talk to your mother. And so Sharon's a teacher and said, okay, but first we're going to freeze it, make it really solid. I don't want this smell kicking around. And uh, so in the morning, uh, Stephen heads off with his little bag. And I thought, oh, this is so reminiscent. Anyway, uh, she phones the teacher, yeah. but the teacher hasn't arrived yet. So Sharon gets to school, forgets to phone the teacher, and uh, Stephen, get, and Stephen gets to class, and lo and behold, it's a substitute teacher. <laughs> so she opens the book and goes, 
Oh, show and tell. Steven, my turn, my turn, my turn. <laughs> so he runs to the cloakroom, pulls up to the front, reaches in, and pulls up this halibut head and says, two eyes and one side of its head. And the little girl in the front row barfs. <laughs> So they kind of clean it up and get the mess. <laughs> Unfortunately, the jungle telegraph at Herbert Spencer's, boom, 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 boom. And they found that the janitor had taken the head and throw it in the garbage can. Wow, it was like rats heading out. <laughs> so during recess, the head comes out and lunch hour, the head comes out. <laughs> and uh, so Sharon gets home and Stephen's going, oh, it was great. Bernadette barfed and it was just, I was a hero for a day. And I was in and out of the garbage can. And so the next morning, Sharon phones the school and goes to, you know, <laughs> apologize. <laughs> and the teacher says, well, thanks very much, but as it turned out, I wasn't there, so it didn't bother me too much at all. <laughs> anyway, enough digressing about that. <laughs> Those are things that happen in small towns. Um, you went to school on the island? In, at the old Queen Elizabeth, uh, down near uh, Heap Spoiler, uh, with the um, SRY running in behind uh, the school, and then uh, Ewan Avenue out front. Okay. And uh, I think it was um, six, six or six, six rooms. And then uh, when I was there, they built a bit of an addition in the back. So my sister, I was in grade three and she was in grade two when we were in a split class. And then grade four, I was in a split class and she was in three. And then um, they reduced uh, or changed the split with the high school. So grade seven came down to uh, Queen Elizabeth. And so I... At about 12 years old, I ever wondered if I'd ever get off Queensboro and get to somewhere else. So a small aside there. Um, my mind is kind of rambling. You'll have to take this and edit like mad. No but it was uh, interesting uh, being in Queensboro when the sun set, because there wasn't a um, terrible lot of buildings um, and there were, there were no high-rises for sure, uh, when the sun reflected off all the houses on 6th Avenue and Edmonds and Cumberland from Queensboro looking up, it, they reflected gold. And as a, as a very young child, thinking, wow, I wonder what it's like to have gold windows. Mm -hmm. And then we drive up to visit family on Nanaimo Street uh, and a few other places in London. And I'd look at the houses going, it's a nicer house than mine, but there's no gold windows. And it was kind of grade seven before you get to science refraction, you realize you've been had by a sun, uh, sunbeam, but it was fascinating as a kid. So look up the hill and see these golden windows. So. Peter, you're very patient. It just keeps going. No, no, this is great. <laughs> you, um, you, you, uh, you, 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 had, you came to high school in New West then? Yeah, I went to um, Vincent Massey in uh, 1963. Uh, just, I guess it was two years before they amalgamated the high school and made uh, New Westminster Secondary out of that. And there's another piece about a small, small town that's very interesting. Um, I had a, uh, my grade 8 uh, math teacher was a, um, a very young woman, I think she was a bit nervous, um, didn't uh, use a lot of control over the class, and so I um, remember a young man, uh, Ron Karens, would come into the classroom rather than through the door, he'd come through a window from the parking lot side just to be the class clown. And um, 30, yes, fast forward to 30 years later. My son Stephen is having some challenges in math because the class won't settle down and kids are climbing in through the window from the parking lot. So uh, we thought we'd better go have a te uh, meet the teacher. And so it was a missus those days and uh, went in and there was this aged uh, lady there with the principal and we were having a conversation and I was thinking, there's something oddly familiar about that, about that lady. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't figure it out. And then uh, things got a bit tense and she chewed her lower lip, and I thought, my God, it's my grade eight math teacher. <laughs> and lo and behold, it was the same teacher in the same room. It was, yeah, it was very odd. So New West has been a, a funny area about not reaching out to integrate. It's been quite insular. Mm -hmm. And I think that reflects uh, through a lot of policies we see here in town. Do you, but I'm addressing um, more. <laughs> do you, uh, did, did you have that same sort of sense of being insular in Queensboro? Oh yeah, that, that was the interesting part, is that um, you know now we have, I think it's 10 community groups uh, across New Westminster, but when I was growing up, there was clearly the Queensboro folks, there was the Uptown folks, and Sapperton. Mm -hmm. 
Never heard of Brow of the Hill, never heard of Glenbrook North where we live. Uh, the West End was kind of there, but you have to remember in the 50s, from 20th Street to 23rd was still DL-172. It actually was no man's land. It wasn't part of New West yet. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of, we had some relatives lived up there, and mm -hmm. he'd go visit, and it was kind of, isn't that odd? Sidewalks on the east side of the street, gravel on your side of the street. You know, it was just... Mm -hmm. So when they joined New West and got a school, I kind of thought, well, this is earth-shaking. But... Um, I couldn't tell what changed because they still, folks we knew still lived there and the kids still went to school, but uh, people told me it was a big deal. But as a kid, you'd look at it going, they got sidewalks. <laughs> that was about all you could tell. Mm -hmm. so. In what kind of a house did you live in Quimper? Uh We lived in a house that my dad had bought in 1948. Uh, Mrs. Soberg had lived there before. And I'm not, I don't, didn't ever find out how old the house was, but I've got to believe that he bought it when it was 20 or 25 years old. So that would have put it back to about 1925, 1930. I think it was born, built uh, before the, uh, somewhere around the Depression. Um, the, my dad had, uh, when he bought it, um, had renovated by putting a, a new foundation under most of it. Um, opening up the garage to put a, a, bay, a car bay into it, uh, redid the, the wiring and the uh, plumbing, and then put a new exterior. What's, what I find fascinating about all of that is the house is still standing at the corner of Ewan Avenue and Lawrence Street. And so when you look at Ewan Avenue and the, the, the houses that have been knocked down and redeveloped, why that house stands there is beyond my imagination. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can tell you that was interesting is uh, because it's on a slab, it's a floating foundation. When I left, the house had a wee list to the west, and now when I drove by to show my grandchildren, it has a wee list to the east. So <laughs> I, not, not if you can really tell, but it's just the house is kind of going back and forth. But the house was, uh, so it was a two-story you know, it was uh, two bedrooms on the main, and then uh, we, uh, in about 1958, my father was always pushing the uh, the envelope. About the same time, we got our first black and white TV in 1956. Uh, the wood burning, coal burning uh, st uh, furnace was out. We had elect uh, had the uh, oil uh, furnace put in, hmm. and it was amazing. A thermostat, you just picked the temperature, and it <laughs> stayed there. <laughs> The unfortunate thing is they didn't tell me too much about the thermostat. Mm -hmm. So as a child, you had to kind of learn about yeah. thermostats. So I was babysitting one time, I was maybe 11 or 12, my folks were out, and um, we were a little cold. So I knew if you played with the thermostat, things went on. And I'm not sure I understood the relationship between the dial and the numbers on the outside, because I never actually opened the little door to look inside before. Mm -hmm. But I did turn it to the right, and there was a click and a whirl, and the furnace came on. I thought, oh, that's pretty good. And then we thought, oh, it's getting pretty hot. Now what do we do? Oh, I don't know. Well, if turning it to the right helped last time, I'll turn it to the right again. <laughs> anyway, the house got to the point where we're sort of walking around dying. <laughs> My folks came in and said, what the hell is going on? Go to the thermostat. And by then I had it about 88. The house was just a sauna. <laughs> and so they pointed out, if you go to a lower number, it'll turn off. And I went, oh, of course. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. That was a slow learn. But anyhow, the benefit of all the, the change from uh, wood and coal to oil was I got the, uh, had been the, uh, the, the uh, sawdust storage area. It was these two huge bins, which I then uh, occupied as my bedroom. But what was fascinating for me is my godfather, who worked at Star Shipyard as a finished carpenter, uh, did all the work with plywood and little moldings. And so uh, the decor was remarkably efficient, commercial, and didn't look at all like the rest of the house. <laughs> and my mother, in a fit of God knows what, painted it a robin's egg blue. So I grew up thinking I lived in the sky somehow. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it was neat. And then... Uh, I remember, uh, do I just keep going here? Yeah, okay, fine. so I remember, uh, again, being an early adopter, my father thought the, the deep freeze was a remarkable thing. <coughs> so the deep freeze arrived, and I thought, 
what the hell is this for? So the first thing my mother threw in there was ice cream. And I go, oh, I'm big into deep freezes. But uh, my uh, mother had an uncle who owned a gas station in Coquitlam. And uh, he was an entrepreneur. He was just, uh, he married uh, a Scandinavian lady, my, uh, my mother's aunt. But I think he might have been a bit uh, Middle Eastern because he was very swarthy, had a dark uh, beard and uh, hair. But he was always looking for a deal. Mm-hmm. So the first winter, we ended up with a half a cow in the deep freeze. And I thought, wow, a half a cow. Now, little did I know they were going to butcher it on the kitchen table. So I came home and Clarence from across the street was over. And it was a Sunday and it was saws and meat and blood. And suddenly all the brown paper came out and it went in the fridge, or deep freeze. And that turned out pretty good because there was steaks and there was roasts. So, yeah, it's okay. Um, but then towards the end, I noticed that there was more stew meat. And then at the very end, there was a lot of soup because the whole of was the bones, but <laughs> they, they threw nothing away. And so the following year, we'd had our fill of beef and it became a half a pig one in there and went through the process. And um, so that, I guess that part of what Queensboro about was about, um, we preserved a lot of food. We would be freezing uh, uh, beef, freezing pork, and because my dad was a tenderman, uh, tenderman is a uh, fisherman who goes around and p- picks up fish and takes it back to the cannery. So the route he worked on was you'd leave Vancouver, uh, go up the Strait of Georgia to Cape Scott, go down the outside and then come back to Vancouver. And they do that every seven days. They'd leave on Monday morning and come back on Saturday night or Sunday morning and then he'd come home with a change of clothes. So um, the story that uh, I always tell and my, my now become a bit of a legend is uh, that we'd walk him down to the boat at uh, Gore Avenue and he'd have two suitcases, uh, two grips actually. Uh, one was full of clothes and the other one made a fl- clinking sound. In those days, um, the fishing industry uh, was fueled by a lot of alcohol. So. And then we'd pick him up the following week, we'd pick it up and one grip was closed and the other one made a squishing sound because all the fish going home that then got canned on the kitchen table that night that we would uh, use. <laughs> Um, so this um, Gore Avenue uh, downtown Vancouver that's where Canadian Fish uh, had their main processing plant okay, okay. And, and so all the tender all the packers would go in there and and the t- so a tender man was like uh, picking up from all the all the fishing camps yeah basically uh, the system was um, Canadian Fish and BC Packers had collection points all over the coast mm-hmm. and so what the packer did would go to the collection point and then pick up from a, a cold storage or a warehouse, then put it in a bigger boat, and then would go around and get the fish all uh, from all the stations. So I'm not quite, I don't think they stopped in the Strait of Georgia, uh, sorry, yeah, Strait of Georgia, but they would probably start from um, Port Hardy south on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Okay. I know for a fact they would go into Euclid because uh, we had friends there and a couple of trips. I actually went over, stayed for a week, and then got in the boat and came back with my dad okay. that way. Okay. But, uh, and um, um, was there any kind of relationship between living in Queensborough and his job? I mean, how how do how do you, how do you pick Queensborough? About where my dad picked Queensborough? Well, how, how, yeah, how do you, how do you, was it connected to his job or did he? Um, no, he um, he, he uh, had come, well. First off, he'd come from Norway uh, in the 1920s. Uh-huh. Uh, initially, going to Minnesota like most Norwegians and. Um, but then, you know, Minnesota's kind of flat and it's not really where Norwegian belongs. And had heard about the West Coast and uh, fell in love with the, the scenery, the fjords and the rocks. And uh, he was a hand logger for quite a little time in Port Hardy. Uh, he had saved up his money and had a steam donkey, had a partner, and they would do hand logging, make up their booms, uh-huh. and they'd ship it. Um, he bragged that in the 1930s, after a whole year of work, whole year of work, he'd made $28, which was big money. And I'm kind of looking and going, I can't believe it. But anyway, that, that didn't end all that well because um, he had come into town to pick up grub or something. And when he got back to Port Hardy, his partner had stole the donkey and taken off, and that was the end of his adventure. So he then um, ended up somehow buying a small uh, gill netter which he used uh, on the uh, Strait of Georgia up towards Rivers Inlet South, uh, different fisheries, and he fished in the river. And um, in those days, you had uh, different kind of trophies. Uh, I'm not sure where it is, but there's a picture 
of my dad as a very young man, younger than me, standing in front of his gill netter, which he lived on, uh, holding up a eagle that he'd shot. So all bent and twisted. And I'm thinking, that's not quite the way you picture bald eagles these days. <laughs> <laughs> Being hung up by a fisherman. So. Yeah. But uh, that's sort of the way it went. They, they lived close to the land. And anyway, so in one of his trips, uh, let's see, how do we start? One of his trips to the coast, um, he'd met my mother. And so he was uh, in his 40s. My mother uh, was from Saskatchewan, had lived on the farm, had four sisters, but um, had decided that she'd kind of done with Saskatchewan. And by then, um, the, the, uh, the farm hand in uh, my dad, grandfather's farm had moved uh, to, new, to British Columbia. Uh, John had started working at Star Shipyard, and my godmother had come out. And he really was a, a, a carpenter when he was in Norway, had come to Saskatchewan, worked as a farmhand, but he just wasn't what he wanted to do, so he came out here. So my, my mother had come to visit them, and in coming out, my father met her, and uh, romance blossomed, but you got to put some pieces in there when a 45-year-old meets a 20-year-old, there was an accident along the way. Here I am today. So, edit that as you like. <laughs> okay. okay. So... Um, he ended up buying in Queensboro, I think, because that's where um, he'd met people. And plus, there was a reasonably robust uh, set of friends uh, that were in Queensboro. And, and as I've grown up and gone back to Norway uh, and, re- and visited Vikabuk, where he came from, um, I realized that um, all of his the friends that he, we'd had as kids, or his acquaintances, had all been in the Tresfjord, Romstal Fjord area. And so with a circle of about 20 miles... They'd all lived together, they knew each other, and they came out. So uh, it was really like the Italian community and the Indian community. You went where your contacts were for your support system. Mm -hmm. And like when he came here, when he came from uh, Minnesota, he learned a bit of English there, but learned most of his English out here. But like every language, it's kind of a pidgin Norwegian English. So he, uh, he had no desire to go back home to Norway until he remarried uh, in the 80s. And uh, so he went back after 50 years thinking, oh, I'm going to go back to my native land and things will be good and I'll be happy. But he found out his Norwegian had kind of failed to the point where, you know how language, languages move? Like, you know, mm-hmm. Quebecois is kind of an old French or the modern Parisian. Mm-hmm. Well, Norwegian was the same. So in front of the Oslo strange train station, he was jabbering away, but unable to hail a cab because he had such archaic Norwegian. <laughs> Which was a real disappointment to him. And so when he uh, did get up to Romstal, and um, as a kid, he was telling us how clear the water was and how tall the mountains were and how abundant the fish were. And so when he came home, and we were like, what'd you think, Dad? Yeah, the mountains aren't as tall. And the water's <laughs> not quite as clean. You know, so <laughs> you, when you're here, you romanticize things. The part I found interesting about that, though, is... Um, when we visited uh, where his uh, home in Vikabukt, um, I, I can only say I was flabbergasted because uh, when we grew up, uh, we had a large uh, backyard uh, with a uh, lilac bush at the back stairs, uh, a couple of pear trees, uh, pl- two plum trees, an Italian plum and a, a, trans- a yellow plum. Um, we had a cherry tree. Uh, we had a Gravenstein apple tree, we had a transparent apple tree, and, and everybody in Queensboro had trees. You, you just grew your own fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then strangely though, I, uh, we had a picture on the front of the house. We walked around the back, and, and my blood didn't run cold, I can't say, but I was taken aback when I saw a lilac tree growing at my grandfather's back door. And my dad had always said that my grandfather had this hobby of grafting fruit trees together. And so uh, over the couple of hundred yards behind the house, I walked through and found almost the same trees that my father had planted in Queensboro. And it still gives me goosebumps. It's very weird. And so a bit of an odd story. Um, my, my daughter, uh, uh, oldest daughter, was with us. I was with a couple of my dad's uh, uh, nephews. And uh, we stood on the back of the house for a family picture and um, my wife is taking the picture and she's moving us around and mm-hmm. pushing us all together and uh, we get home she develops the picture and she goes ah look at the hole 
between you and um, I think it was uh, Helge. Uh, no, uh, anyway. And she says, oh. And she says, why did I do that? And I looked at her and said, because my dad was standing there. Mm-hmm. And she goes, what? I said, yeah, well, I don't know. That's weird. But I had this sense about the ghosts kind of thing, because the family had lived there a very long time. And so anyway, um, she takes the picture a couple of days later and goes to our daughter's house and said, look at this terrible picture. I got this hole here. Your dad says, and she, before my wife can finish, my uh, daughter says, that's where grandpa was standing. It was just like this misty fjord, this rocky piece of land, and this family of strange misfits who were whalers and carpenters and shoemakers yeah. continued to occupy. It was, it was almost mystical. We went back uh, with my sister and brother two years ago, and I was hugely disappointed in that um, one of the current members of the family had decided he wanted to build a new home when they burned down the farm home. And um, I think the barn's still there, but some of the mystique uh, was gone, but it was the most incredible yeah. moment about touching your roots that I'd ever had in my entire right. life. So, anyway, digressing way away from Queensboro, sorry. <laughs> Let's go back to, how about a question to lead where you want to go? Okay, so, <laughs> so, so <laughs> back, back to Queensboro, you've, you've talked about... Um, uh, you've talked about some of the places that people, yep. uh, who, when you were growing up around you, were working. Can you um, can you maybe just round that out and just describe some of the places? Sure. Uh, where were places that people were working while okay. you were growing up? Okay. So the one that was always the most obvious was when you were driving down um, Ewan Avenue and you would be stopped for the Queensboro Railway or Queensboro Bridge was the BC Box Manufacturing on the right-hand side. It was ultimately became a McMillan Bloedel Mill, and it's now, um, um, oh, I love being old, I forget what the hell they call that subdivision in Queensboro, uh, Port Royal. Port Royal. Um, and then uh, as I got older and got my bicycle, I, I realized off to the uh, left side of the road was um, Star Shipyard and another small mill in there. And um, Star Shipyard, I, uh, I loved it when the, when the new bridge was built, the buses would take you a loop past Star Shipyard and then go down to Richmond and come back. So if you sat in the bus, you could always see what they were building uh, at the shipyard. And uh, when I was, so later on we'll talk about when I was working, but it was always um, interesting to me when I was working, seeing tugs and fish boats that I'd seen arising from skeletons on the ways to being actually functioning equipment. It was uh, just remarkable. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, there was also Alaska Pine, or not Alaska Pine, um, the Interforce Sawmill, actually the Queensboro Bridge, mm-hmm. which was uh, very old. And uh, again, if the folks, if your parent, if the, I, I, we were very few fishermen in my uh, age group. Most of the kids' parents worked uh, at one of the mills around. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I can't think of I can't think of a single classmate whose parent didn't work in Queensboro at one of the mills. And uh, I do remember, though, when um, uh, Martin Paper built the paper mill in Queensboro, and uh, they opened it to the public uh, the first uh, couple of days just to let people know what was in the neighborhood. It was the first time I'd ever seen you know, corporate relations on that scale. Cause uh, at our house, uh, my dad was a socialist, and it was always those sons of bitches. And so this was a chance where he actually got inside the the place. And the place that stuck me in my brain was you do the tour, and as a kid, I have very few memories of the machines and just people. My biggest memory is at the end, they produced a cardboard suitcase that all folded up, and we walked out with these little cardboard suitcases. It was astounding. I, what was the name of this mill? Uh, it was Martin Paper, Martin Paper, which then became a Milne Lodell um, uh, paper, a cor- corrugated paper uh, uh, producer. And I think it's gone now that the casino's there and the mills are... I, I, I don't drive down that way. Though. It's right, it would have been right behind the casino. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think it's... I think maybe it's gone now. I haven't been down to look around much. And the interesting part uh, about the, uh, the sawmill next door was the hog fuel, uh, because there was just no market for hog fuel in those days, was put down on a bog uh, beside the mill. And I have no idea what they were going to do with it, but they just kept storing it and storing it. 
which meant that the uh, the bog or the bush couldn't drain uh, into the ditches, mm -hmm. so there'd be these ponds left behind. And in those days, in the 50s and 60s, you had these cold winters, and those kids who knew about it would find a private little pond to go skating on. <laughs> but like every good neighborhood, word would spread out, instead of being five of us skating, it'd be 50 of us skating, and then pretty soon it's so chopped up, there's no Zamboni out there, you'd kind of think, well, because of the wait till it rains, so you'd, you'd sort of cross your fingers that it would rain and then freeze again. Yeah. But it always just rained and it melted and it went away. Yeah. Yeah. So, was uh, there a, did a... Did you use some of that hardwood for heating before you got the... Uh, no, the, we uh, used uh, sawdust. No, we oh, used sawdust. You used sawdust, okay. Yeah, because hog was that mixture of bark that uh, comes... Barks and shavings that come off the log when they, uh, uh -huh. they debark it, brying the milling. And so uh, it's often used as a landfill product because it's light and doesn't deteriorate too quickly. Yeah, yeah, okay. And now I think it's just used as, uh, well, also, it's also called hog fuel because it went to the mills and fed the hog, which went down and produced the steam to mm -hmm. run the plant. So. Mm -hmm. And so uh, keep going around on uh, businesses. So that was sort of the north arm was the heavy industry. The Anasis Channel was... Um, virtually all um, fishing based below the Anasis Causeway. Above the Anasis Causeway was, you know, heaps of machinery and where they built the, uh, uh, the old uh, airplanes and stuff. But uh, below, uh, you'd get a mix of, um, let's see, Canfis Canadian Fish, Canfisco had a small tie up in there. BC Packers were offered in Richmond. But it was almost all um, individual fishermen who had built a shack and uh, moved into it and put a net rack out front. And uh, the net racks were almost homogeneous. There was a few logs strapped together, uh, some planks that they'd either bought or saw on themselves. Uh, the net rack for racking their nets for repairing, because most of those days it was cotton, so you'd always be snagging it and putting new lines on. And the, as I think back now, uh, I, uh, I'm flabbergasted because uh, maybe one out of four or one out of five would have what I was told was a bluestone tank and uh, never thought much about it. And I was always fascinated when they'd step the net in there it was this beautiful blue water. And it wasn't till years later, actually even when I finished chemistry, I was in high school, uh, I got into working at the Port Authority, I realized that bluestone was actually copper sulfate and they were trying to preserve the nets. Mm -hmm. Now the question I have to ask these days is, where the hell did that go? Mm -hmm. My guess is when they sold the net rack, they punched one of the holes out and just went in the river <laughs> and it floated around. Cause that's the unfortunate part of the, the river in the 1950s. It was a, um, a universal uh, waste bin. Um, you know, and again, no one knew better, but um, when I, you know, I joined the Port Authority, you'd go up past the Scott paper and you always knew what shade of toilet paper they were producing because at the end of the shift it'd be pink or green or blue mm -hmm. coming out. And then if you went up uh, past Royal City Cannery, next to the Westminster Railway Bridge on the Upper River Side, um, if they were doing peas, then all the husks would come out or all the apple cores. <laughs> it was just, that's what happened. Yeah, right. And then uh, when the mills, I mean, the, the, the wood in those days, as a kid, I just thought it was great. Uh, the, the mills were so, the wood was so big, they'd have to quarter the logs in the water to make them small enough to go up the jack ladder. And so often near the, uh, the, the, the base of the tree, you'd get a kind of a, 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 a wedge sawed off that may be four or five feet long, five or six inches through, and it tapered down to nothing. Well, as a kid, if you could be lucky enough to find one of these, and there was always a few around, that and the two by four, you had a boat, you'd just go zipping around uh, the shore of the Anasis Channel. And it was always, you know, uh, when we get home, let's not tell mom where we went, because <laughs> nobody had a life jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and you always hope nobody saw you because the jungle telegraph got back you were down there you got hell but it was amazing how much wood was just you know floating around in the water mm -hmm. that you could could use for your own enjoyment mm -hmm. anyway I'm, I'm zipping so back to small businesses my favorite uh, small business was on the uh, south foot of Jardine Street and that was uh, Sather Boatyards and um, Sather's was special in that uh, Melvin uh, was my sister's godfather. And um, 
my he and my dad were pals from uh, from Norway. But uh, in after my godfather no longer worked at uh, Star Shipyard or when came Mercers, I guess they they let some of the older guys go who weren't going to go forward. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, John's job was to clean out the hulls. Uh, so they could continue work. So they, they worked on the inside of the boat building wood, but there'd be shavings and cutting and it would just fall into the bilge. Uh-huh. And so he'd go in every night and clean the bilge out, which they'd put aside to run the boiler to bend the wood the next day. And so as a kid, I'd be invited to come along. And the I can't tell you how strong the images are climbing down to the bilge, feeling these shavings coming up, looking at this hewn wood all around us that had been shaped and nailed and fastened together. It was just like touching the blood of the boat mm-hmm. before it was being built. And to this day, I can't smell cedar without throwing back to the 50s and uh, down in the bilge with a dustpan, picking out the uh, the bits of cedar and chips and shavings. And so when did he keep working? Oh, God. he. Um, I'm going to guess that he worked until... He, he wasn't working when I got married, so probably into the 60s, I guess. So he went, he went from star to Sather. Yeah, so yeah, he basically went from a full-time job to a part-time yeah, job yeah. just to make a few dollars because there was no pensions in those yeah. days to speak of. And because so. at some point uh, star also went in for metal. Yeah, um, well, that's when, uh, that's, I, I'm trying to, oh, good question. I'm trying to remember whether star was doing metal before Mercer's. They must have, because I think they lost, launched um, the uh, Evco um, tugs and a couple of big fish boats before it became Mercer. Okay. Yeah. But he did. He didn't. He didn't. He, did he, he didn't did. make that. Choice. Yeah. No. He he did. He would do uh, the uh, uh, the carpet, the, the finished carpentry inside for the cabinets oh, okay. and the interior okay. finishes. Okay. Yeah. So most. Um, most of the buildings in Queenborough, they were made out of wood. Um, I think they were all wood. That's an interesting question. Now that you say that, um, I'm trying to think when the first metal building I could recall. And, um, you know, I think the first n- non wood frame building I can recall was when the Chevron gas station was built where the uh, rec center is today and it was concrete block and maybe parts of the Queen's Hotel were cast but everything else was wood because as a kid um, there was a bit of terror in waking up in the middle of the night with the sound of sirens because everybody was burning wood uh, not everybody was cleaning their chimneys and so when a chimney fire took hold, you had this torch in the middle and um, I, well, not every year, but I remember at least a, four or five houses that had burned down due to a chimney fire that had taken hold at night when people, everybody was sleeping. Mm-hmm. Did the people use the planks from the mills to uh, the uh, buildings? Um, yes, I think so. Because I... I <laughs> um, I know there was, an, uh, I think the mills, I'm not sure for, sure for sure, but I think the mills had a fair amount of leakage when it came to inventory. Uh, like, put that down. Jenkins put that. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there was a lot of, uh, I remember as a kid when we seen people do renovations. Again, this was sort of prior to, in the 40s, 30s, 40s, and early 50s. It got much more tight in the 60s as new uh, uh, processes came into the mills. But... I remember seeing people opening up their houses to renovate, and it was just heavy, rough saw and timbers. It was just remarkable. Mm-hmm. Uh, matter of fact, our house, um, I guess my dad bought it. There was a cow shed in the back uh, where Mrs. Soberg had kept a couple of cows, and uh, they, they must have taken the building down, but the, uh, the concrete foundation was a, a bit too much. So I remember a few times in the 50s, it was really hot in those days, 57, 58, uh, that uh, we would take a hose and we'd fill up one of the uh, cow watering troughs and we'd pretend we had a pool. Now, at the time, I thought it was great, but I imagine now they're about three feet by three feet. <laughs> <laughs> so you were there during the flood? No, I was born in 50. 
15, well, the 48 feet. flooded mist. Okay. But there was uh, floods in the during the 60s. It was yeah. high waters. Yeah. Yeah. But we were fortunate um, that we had a couple inches in the basement. Uh, New West, uh, West Queensboro sort of undulates, you know, back and forth. And so we just happened to be on a, okay. a piece that's a little bit higher. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, um, did you want to ask me anything more about architecture at the time? Um, maybe, was your house like the standard type of house? But many people lived in similar sort of buildings. Yeah, they were all wood frame, um, lower basements because no one was intended to occupy those. The main floor um, was usually uh, paneled, uh, drywall and plaster. Certainly a few people who were well-to-do had that. Most of it was just um, wood paneling inside, and uh, tons and tons of hideous wallpaper. <laughs> hideous wallpaper. <laughs> I, remember, I remember having uh, the flu, I guess, or something when I was a kid, and uh, I woke up a bit delirious, and I'm staring at the wallpaper, and it was kind of this floral pattern, and I had this vivid memory of the paper taking off and swirling around, and. I thought, oh God, I don't like this feeling at all. So I closed my eyes and back to sleep. <laughs> mm. And um, you could always tell the folks that were more genteel because uh, they would put uh, lampshades uh, over their uh, lamp uh, lights in the middle of the room. Uh, I remember as a kid, right until the, almost the day I got married, having this 150 watt bulb in the middle of our living room shining. 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I got married my wife talked about mood lighting and setting the scene that had any concept that was anything <laughs> other than the surgical light in the middle of the room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, you came to high school. Yes. This side, <laughs> and, uh, and when you came to high school, 63, so Queensboro Bridge... Was open in about 58, I think. Okay. I pride myself in being one of the first users of that bridge. Because the day that WAC came to use it, a bunch of us sort of talked to each other at the bottom on our shiny bicycles, saying, uh, gee, the hoarding, well, we called it the fence in those days, but the hoarding was down, the lines were on, there was a few police around, they were ready to cut the ribbon, and we decided if we went like madmen, we could get as far up the bridge before they caught us, then we could ride back down. So we all got our bikes and we rode uphill, and uh, being kids from Queensboro, land is flat. <laughs> Going up the hill, I thought we were climbing Mount Everest. <laughs> so anyway, we got we got halfway up. <laughs> these weren't three-speed bikes; they were just basic coasters, and we're going up. <laughs> and uh, so we turned around, and uh, we went shooting down the bridge. And all I remember is my eyes tearing, my knuckles turning white, thinking. I don't ever want to go this fast again. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it wasn't all that fast, but it was fascinating. But the other story with the Queensboro Bridge is um, it was tantalizing to have a hill in Queensboro because it was flat. So uh, somewhere around 1960, uh, there was a very large uh, snowstorm. And uh, virtually the, the uh, traffic stopped everywhere. And uh, we kept hearing, because like, we, by then we had a TV, and you'd hear about sledding and skiing, and we had no idea what that was. So, uh, because I was the oldest, I said to my brother and sister, well, if we had a sled, we could go up on the bridge and we could slide down, because there was no traffic moving. And they went, yep. So we thought, well, what can we do for a sled? So, I don't know. So we kind of noodled around, and lo and behold, at some construction site or somebody's house, we found a pallet. Um, yeah, probably belonged to somebody, but that was not an issue in those days. You just bored what you need, mm -hmm. took what you need. So we took it home, uh, took the boards off the bottom, and because I had access to a handsaw, we cut little points on the ends of one side, <laughs> and uh, we uh, we dragged it up. I think maybe we put tin on the end. I think we took cans and, and wire stairs and tin snips and, and put tin on the end, trying to make these things a little bit slippery on the end of the points. And we dragged it up the bridge, and uh, we uh, then looked back down the bridge, and my brother, who was five years younger than me, went, I'm not going down this bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and being the oldest, listening to the youngest voice of reason, I thought, yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> so my sister was going, well, if you guys, oh, come on, Helen, it's going to be great. 
So she, I don't know about this. So anyway, she gets on and we give her this mighty push and she gets going down the hill. And I th- she's screaming. I think she's enjoying this. What we didn't know is that she was sliding down the front of the pallet. And so finally, her ankles are over the front of the pallet. <laughs> exactly. Hits a pile of snow. <laughs> comes to a crash. <laughs> stands up. And so she comes down and she's crying a little bit. And we're kind of, what's the matter? Oh, I think I hurt my ankles. Well, don't tell anybody. <laughs> so we dig her out, leave the pallet there, and then go home. <laughs> but it was just what you did in those days. It was so funny. Anyway, sorry. The, 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 um, when, the, when the bridge came in, did that, did, that, did that make more connections over to Richmond? Connection, you, know, I've you know, it's funny, no. Um, no. It, 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 when you see 91 now and the flow back and forth, uh, it was rare to see anybody come off the bridge and go down uh, Westminster Highway to, Queens, to uh, Richmond. Because yeah. basically there was nothing down there. Yeah. I mean, in, when I, in the 50s and 60s, um, I remember to get in the corner of Westminster Highway and, and uh, Number 3 Road, and there was a burger stand, a gas station, and I have no recollection of anything else there. I go down to Queen, R- Richmond now and drive down Number Three Road. I'm I'm, I'm absolutely lost. I, I just feel like a foreigner. Mm-hmm. I have no idea where anything is down there. Mm-hmm. It's remarkable. Okay. So 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 when you when you went to school when yeah. you went to the high school you're trying um, to get there, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I really am. You uh, you. Um, you, you, you came, came across on the, on the bridge, on the Queensboro Bridge? Yep. Uh, by bus. By yeah. bus, yeah. yeah. So t- t- tell, tell us about coming up to high school in New West. Um, it was maybe, a, may, perhaps one of the most frightening days of my life because um, there was, we went from like 28 kids to hundreds of kids and uh, home rooms and platooning between classrooms was kind of odd. But I did find my homeroom, I did get my locker, and thought lockers were the most amazing things. You could put your stuff in them and you could lock. But I was so naive. I just, I look back now, I just told this story to my grandchildren about being so naive. About the second or third day of school, my locker mate said, oh, can you give me your combination? My friends have got mine and they're just bugging around my locker and I'll put my things in the safe in your locker. I went, sure. So I gave it to him. Next day I come, I can't get into my locker because he's put his lock on my locker. <laughs> I'm going, what the hell do I do now? <laughs> so, so to be perfectly honest, I don't recall what I did, but I think I packed my books around for the next year because I didn't have a locker. <laughs> 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 we weren't the most worldly kids out of Queensboro, I have to tell yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, was, there a, was there a sense that you were different? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You... you uh, the, the Queensboro kids hung out with the Queensboro kids and the Saperton kids hung out with the Saperton kids. And in those days it was even exacerbated. In the high school there were the sweater clubs in grade uh, 10, I guess 9, 10 onward. And, um, and those were the ultimately cool kids. They're the ones who had access to cars and they played football and they played basketball. And we just, you know, they were almost mystiques. We didn't know what they did. So it was all very weird. Mm-hmm. And some of the Queensboro kids would get involved in that. And then, I tended to be a nerd, so along with my, well, I joined Sea Cadets when I was 12 or 11, uh, which I thought was just this amazing organization. They actually let you play in boats, and they gave you the boat to play with. It was amazing. Um, so we, we'd always hang out together, and uh, often we'd go to the library and pour over the, because magazines, I mean, there were just as many magazines as you could read, and they came out every month. Uh, in Queensboro, you got a newspaper, but you never thought about buying a magazine because that was just more money than you wanted to put out. Mm-hmm. Besides, you bought a magazine, you couldn't buy ice cream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and was, um, uh, how was, how, can, can you talk about how, I mean, how was that different? I mean, I, 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 I you know, I don't, I don't want to say, I don't want to say that, you, you know, yeah. Queensboro, they were mills and they weren't mills elsewhere because I don't think that was true. No, they, there, was a, there, um, were, there was more similarity between the Saperton kids and the Queensboro kids because uh-huh. they were very, that was rich, the, 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 the working class uh-huh. families. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the uptown kids, there was doctors and dentists and accountants and shopkeepers. But the, the kids from the other ends of town, it was uh, a lot, uh, the, there was an economic difference, there was uh, some bias around uh, what their parents did. 
they certainly weren't involved uh, in municipal politics. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, I don't know that Queensborough had a residence association until perhaps the late 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, because often uh, in Queensboro, uh, socialization was uh, centered around um, the PTA events at the school. Uh, the Italian community would focus on the Roma Hall when it was the old Roma Hall, the small one. And um, the um, Indian community would be centered around the temple on, uh, on Boyne Street, which mm -hmm. then moved over to Wood Street. And so there, it, there wasn't a, a political movement yeah. uh, in the area. Yeah. Yeah. So back to the high school, how did it... Um, I think what, what the, the, the biggest difference uh, was when you got to the high school, um, there was always this piece of oral legend. So in the high school, the oral legend was uh, the kids from Queensboro were tough, mean, and could fight. And the kids from Saperton were tough, mean, and could fight. And legend had it there had been massive fights in Moody Park. Not that I'd ever been to one or heard about one, but that was the legend. And so you kind of wanted to walk around swaggering, but at 13 you know you're a dork and you don't know how to do it. <laughs> so you try to keep a low profile. Yeah. But so there was, a, and so again, I, I can't remember anything overt about it, yeah. but it was, uh, New West is this way. It's, uh, there's got some uh, perceptions of culture and class that were out there, and rather than questioning them, certainly in the, 50, in the 60s, you just fit into your niche and try to, to get by. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm not okay. sure it goes where you want to go, but. Yeah, you know, no, no, yeah. no, that, that's yeah. fine. I mean, yeah. one, one of the things that we're. You know that's interesting. What Annika is finding is that uh, you know there wasn't a community plan in Queensborough until quite late. Um, no, and that's, yeah. You know that's that's interesting. Yeah. Know. Well, but the Queensboro part of it was um, it's so unlike the rest of New Westminster. They didn't know what to do with it, and you know again, uh, Gordon Campbell. You know, you like him. I, th I thought he was. I thought he was a brilliant man. In the, I loved the way he could um, uh, engage people, particularly around aim high, aim for the moon, because the worst you could do is miss by a little. And so, in the I think it was the early '60s, as a kid, I would hear about these plans. And so, you look where Port Royal is now. That was on a mill site, but adjacent to Port Royal, where uh, Griff Lumber is now, and that. Uh, that was a vacant piece of land where uh, the Port Authority and Public Works uh, pumped in a shot of sand that they couldn't dispose of, and it raised up, which, just tangentially, made a great skating rink for three years in a row. It was huge. Uh, but tangentially, somebody had said, geez, this is a way of getting Queensboro above the floodplain. If we could um, raise uh, land up, let it preload, and then get people to trade us their houses for these new plots, and they build a new house. We would just work this plot around Queensboro and flood proof the whole thing. At the time, I thought, oh God, I might lose my house and this and that. But when I think back, had anybody had the vision to drive that forward, Queensboro would be, you wouldn't recognize it today for what it is. It would look so much different. So it, it's interesting to me how these bold ideas that seem to work in so many places can't seem to work in New West. Mm -hmm. um, can you can you uh, take us through uh, through high school into your first job? <laughs> okay. How uh, uh, my, <laughs> your graduation so, or not? No, no. My first my, so my. My first, so uh, high school, um, I, you know, I had an average um, high school. I, I um, was ordinary in grade 8, grade 9, and made the honor roll in grade 10, but my friends gave me the hard time because I'd chosen three shop electives, and I, I really loved shop, um, and that was actually where I was going to go had I not been uh, diverted into the Port Authority. We'll talk about that another time. Uh, I was going to be a shop teacher, but um, I... Uh, so I got to be 16, and uh, my father uh, was very pragmatic. His uh, feeling was, 
I fended for myself when I was 13. You're 16. I've given you a three-year advantage. Feel free now to take care of your uh, medical, your dental, and whatever else you need because you're a man. And um, so, I, again, I didn't know enough about anything. And I had heard that there was lots of good jobs at the cold storage, which was the old PCT cold storage where the houses are now. So I, not knowing where to start and not asking enough questions, I boldly walked down to the terminal, walked in and saw the cold storage there and uh, said, oh, I'd uh, like to get a job. And they said, oh, good, we're just uh, freezing uh, strawberries. And I, oh, okay. And so I immediately signed up, went home, got some work clothes and started to work for Cascade Foods which had sublet a piece of the cold storage. So while well, everybody was suggesting I go look at long shoring, I ended up doing food processing in a cold storage at $1.35 an hour. Who was suggesting you should go to My family. Oh, your, your family yeah, was yeah. saying go... Yeah, go down to the docks and do get a job. Shoring. Yeah. And you ended up in the cold storage. Yes, because I didn't know enough to ask about how do you do that <laughs> and didn't go to the long shore office on 10th Street, I went right to the terminal. Okay. So, Another example of me just running headlong into a lack of knowledge and stupidity. <laughs> so the only, the only good part uh, of all of that was almost all the girls that I had gone to school with worked on the line picking out the husks and uh, running the uh, stuff through. So um, the only unfortunate part though is that it was a very short season. Strawberry lasted about a month and then we did blueberries for about a month and then we're unemployed. But um, I was very disappointed in that I I was working really hard and I found out they hired me for my brawn, not, not my brain. Because the best job in the whole place uh, was they, blueberry, fruit started out in a washer, went up a belt and got hand picked and processed and then went into a hopper where it was mixed with sugar and was canned. So the best job in the whole place was the guy on top of the belt who put the sugar in. And I just worked like a dog to be the guy dumping the sugar in. All I ever got was going back and forth to the cold storage with these huge vats of berries going to the jam preservers rather than the other side. Now, having said that, I didn't eat jam for 20 years knowing where those berries came from. So, <laughs> <laughs> These girls that you knew from school who were working the line? Mostly from Queensborough, strangely. Just, okay, just doing summer jobs or yep. While, yep. while still in school? Yeah, yeah. it's just a summer job that went through okay. July through August. Okay, yep. and so your first job started as a summer job? Yep. Yeah. As well, knowing, so, knowing that you were going to go back to school. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That was my first job as a summer job. Yeah. And then um, to make a few, because my dad was insisting I go along the way, um, my second part time job was I was the sweeper at uh, Jackson Printing. Uh, um, oh, Don Jackson, who was Toby Jackson's son, was involved with the Sea Cadet Corps in New Westminster. And by the time I was 17, I had become a petty officer there. And Don needed somebody to sweep his shop up every night after school. And so I got uh, hired uh, for the princely sum of $10 a week, which I'd walk from the high school up on 8th Avenue down to Royal, sweep the place out for an hour and a half, for an hour, and then get on the bus and then go back to Queensboro. But um, it was great. I, I loved it. I just loved it. So I actually spent uh, two summers there um, working on deciding whether to be, a, uh, be an apprentice apprentice or not. And I got fascinated with typesetting and um, how the whole process went. And as a bit of a parlor game, can continue to impress my wife and my grandchildren by being able to read upside down and backwards. <laughs> Poor Peter's suffering here. Just get on to the good stuff he's saying. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's, that's great. Um, summer job at PCT, yeah. and printing then with, job, yeah. um, and and uh, well, first of all, what came next? But but also, yeah, well, I, want, I want to ask you a slightly different question. But okay. what, what came next after that? So after that, um, I uh, I went. Uh, I finished grade twelve, uh -huh. and I. Um, uh, didn't move quickly, so I didn't finish grade 12 with great marks, so I had to go to Douglas College to, uh -huh. to do two years of uh, upgrading to qualify to transfer to UBC. Uh -huh. um, fortunately, uh, my sister had married a man who had a friend who was dating the harbor master's daughter, 
in New Westminster. Mm -hmm. And during freshet, they needed some extra deckhands. So knowing I was in sea cadets and could know which way the boat was up and which way was down, I got hired for some of the freshet work. And that's how I became known to the Port Authority. And so to fast forward uh, just a little bit, because there's a funny story there, and that when I look at what my children have to do to get a job today, about competing with hundreds of people and doing psychological testing and physical testing and having marks up the yin-yang, I'm embarrassed to say my career started by, um, I was looking for a job, a summer job in Anastas Island to get a, something in the manufacturing down there. Mm -hmm. I was, I was walking across the Anasis Causeway, which we should talk about at some other date. Um, I came across Tom Grozier, who had been uh, the captain on the patrol vessel while I was uh, doing the freshet relief, who had become the harbor master. So I went up to Tom and said, uh, Tom, I'm looking for a job. And Tom said, well, don't talk to me because I'm leaving. This man here is the new harbor master. It was Ed Winter. I'd never met him before. And so I said, I'm looking for a job. He says, great, we're going to launch a new boat tomorrow on Monday morning. Can you be the deckhand for the summer? I went, sure I can. And that's how I got involved with the Port Authority. And you, were, you were a student by this point? I was, yeah, I was actually uh, just uh, finishing my first year at UBC Industrial Ed. Uh -huh. I worked part-time along the way. And where that gets crazy was um, I was relieving for a man who had a heart attack. And um, it turned out that he didn't want to come back to work when I went to UBC. And so they'd hired somebody else. And um, I think I have horseshoes in my butt sometimes because I had, was working to be an industrial education teacher. I'd married my wife. We'd moved into a little apartment on 4th Avenue. We were like little poor church mouse. We didn't have a TV because we had to have a place to sit first. So anyway, um, I'm going to UBC for two days. And I get this phone call saying, the deckhand didn't work out. Do you want to come back? And so I just, in an instant, thought, teach little kids who don't want to learn or play boats for the rest of my life. I don't play boats. So I said yes. <laughs> I went to UBC, said, I'm going to withdraw. And they said, okay, uh, let's, oh, you have a scholarship. Yes, just a minute. They ran in the back and gave me a check for my scholarship. And I thought, don't you keep that? Anyway, I ended up with a check for $350, or no, $450, which I then came down 6th Street, stopped at a TV shop, bought a TV, brought it home, and set it up. And so my wife, also on one day, my wife comes in the door from working hard, opens the door, hears people talking, says, oh, who's here? And I said, nobody. Walks in, sees a color television set, sees me, looks at her watch and says, what the hell is going on? I said, oh, I quit school. I'm working for the Port Authority. We can afford a TV now. <laughs> well, after two weeks of marriage, she pointed out to me, this is not the way couples go forward in making decisions about how to make, spend your life. As it turned out, it was a good decision. So I digress way more there again. Okay, okay that's great. <laughs> That's great. So, so when you say you almost became an in industrial design teacher, you, oh yeah, you really almost became an industrial. T <laughs> oh, I was only saved by good luck. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, uh, how's how's your time? I mean, uh, um, I'm Mike. I got to pick up my wife's car by uh, quarter past five. Now, I don't think you want to go that long, but okay. I'm good to live. Okay. I think we've got the room until to four. four yeah. I think you know clearly we're going to be. Continuing at a later date. I, you guys are such good sports about all this stuff. I, I'm sure most of it's drivel, but it's just fun to recount. So. Uh, I think I, th I think that the uh, the new way stuff is very interesting yeah, that's very um, to okay. helping understand yeah. the identity yeah. of, of Queensborough at least. Yeah. And I think the archive will enjoy this because who knows how somebody's going to use this? Well, yeah, who knows? Yeah. Um, so. Okay, so, so you want to keep going from the house on Fourth Avenue, or go back to school again? <laughs> I, let, let's let, 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 let's go to the river. Let's okay. Uh, talk, good. talk about the job of being a deckhand and um, what, what 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 was involved. What was a typical day's work? Um, so first off, um, the, uh, the, the 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 I had worked on. I actually going through school. Um, I had done. We, we just we were just getting into these issues of uh, work experience programs. 
And a friend of mine who was in Sea Cadets with me had said, I'm going to go to the Port Authority and see if I can spend a day on the patrol boat. And in those days, it was the original Port Freezer, which was a steel, heavily built uh, tug in some respects. And so we uh, went out on this thing and we went out uh, up the river to uh, Maple Ridge and back. And all I thought was, you sit on a boat, you eat your lunch, you have coffee, you talk to guys that come by. This is a good job. I, I like this. And uh, so then the, uh, the next uh, year later, uh, the Freshet King that I got hired for, and by then they'd sold the steel boat, and they had a 28-foot uh, uh, Lindcraft uh, run or 28-foot boat with two uh, six-cylinder engines that went like the scared cat. And I thought, well, this is neat. I get to eat my lunch, walk to interesting people, and I can go fast in a boat. This is a good job. So, you know, I, I kept playing with the boats, but never thinking I was going to do that. And then, so anyway, when I got hired, they got, they, somebody had stolen the fiberglass one. Port Authority <laughs> lost their boat, believe it or not. But they didn't really want to get it back. Anyway, they built this 30-foot uh, uh, aluminum, 32-foot aluminum, with uh, twin uh, V8s. And, oh, so if you picture a 23-year-old uh, meeting its boat for the first time, and it has two Chevy V8s unmufflered, and you turn it on and it goes, burr, 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 and then you put the levers down and it goes, and I kept thought, this is great. And it was only years later that I thought, so how do we sneak up on the bad guys when they can hear us coming like a Mack truck? So it was a while later that I built a boat for the Port Authority 25 years later that we had huge mufflers installed. <laughs> Patrolling for what? So, um, well, that was the interesting thing in those days. Uh, the Port Authority uh, patrolled, but it didn't have. Uh, um, it, it was it was a, it was the Harbor Commission. It was very political. The appointees were patronage appointees. Uh, it was about economic development. Uh, the the land the, the, they had just bought some land in Surrey. But they still had what was the Overseas Wharf uh, up uh, from Sixth Street up to uh, Swiftshire, mm -hmm. uh, which was operated by Overseas Transport in those days. But the building, the, the, the deck dock was decaying, had been built like 40 or 50 years earlier. Some uh, forklifts had fallen through it. So the port was already already moving off the, uh, the Westminster waterfront. Mm -hmm. So it was really about uh, dealing with the, the public wharfs. Uh, in at Boundary Road in Queensboro, uh, there was a public wharf. There was the public wharf at Eighth Street, where the key is today. There was the public wharf at uh, Sapperton, mouth of Burnett Creek, mm -hmm. and about uh, trying to make sure that nobody stayed on them because they were built by the government to support the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. But the government, the upkeep was tremendous because I think it was something like 28 of them from Steveston up to Maple Ridge. And the government, it was just a, just a money pit sending money into. So they gave them to the Port Authority in 1964. Mm -hmm. And the Port Authority thought, well, great, we'll just charge people rent. But these are Norwegian fishermen and Swedish fishermen and Finns and a bunch of other folks. And they're going, why would I pay you for anything? You don't give me anything. Mm -hmm. Well, a place to tie up. Well, it's already here. Why would I pay for something already here? Mm -hmm. So the deal was, okay, if you're not going to pay, you can't stay here. So they'd tie up, and we'd come by and chase them off, and then they'd go somewhere else, so we'd gone, and they'd go back and tie up, and it was just the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. And then um, there, there was also, this is way before the uh, debris um, catchment up at Laidlaw, so every fresh, there were lots of deadheads come down, and so one of our tasks was of a pilot, or somebody had saw, seen a deadhead, we'd pull it out and uh, take it away. And drop it off wherever the Samson was dropping off deadheads in those okay, days. Okay, so you were you were working with the Samson on some sometimes, yeah. 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 And then um, we evolved a little bit uh, to where we would do um, soundings because in those days the river had a draft of twenty eight feet, and the goal was to get to 38, 20, 30 feet. And uh, now that's forty. I can't believe it. But um, the uh, depth of water was critical to whether ships had come in. So we uh, moved from a rudimentary sounder to a little uh, more quality survey sounder. 
and then we worked with Public Works Canada, Canada to learn how to do uh, optical fixes with a sextant to uh, find the location of the uh, soundings as we went and then we have to interpolate between uh, fixed points to lay down the soundings. And uh, now I watch these, these computer programs where the guys have coffee and punch the button. It's just awesome, just awesome. But, but it was really navigating uh, the way navigation used to be with taking sights and fixes and, and trying to work in the river. And then um, uh, interacting with the pilots uh, who were largely from New Westminster in those days. Um, and um, understanding what their needs were about how they would get off and, and admiring the skill because this is before vessel traffic uh, was watching the river. Uh, radar in the 60s was an improvement over World War II, but just an increment. It wasn't nearly as sophisticated. And some of the old pilots were still doing uh, echo whistling, where they'd blow the whistle, and if they got an echo, they'd know they were somewhere near a beacon to make a turn. It was just uh, astounding uh, to watch. And then one of our other activities was trying to uh, uh, do traffic control because when the when fishing started in the 70s, uh, eight o'clock on Monday morning, the fishermen go out, and between uh, the Queen the, the Patella Bridge and the bottom of Annis's Island, uh, there were probably 150 gillnets that would go out there, another hundred above, and so as tugs would come through, uh, they'd tell guys to get out of the way. They'd be blowing the whistles, and um, some of the companies developed a practice uh, that a deckhand would stand at the bow of the tug with a boom chain. And if the fishermen didn't move, the tech hand's job was to drop the boom chain over the net so it would go to the bottom so the tug could go through. Sure. Which really annoyed the fishermen because they couldn't get the, bo- the, the net back up because the boom chain would hold it down. Sure. So our job was trying to get these fishermen to move. And the usual response was, uh, at best case, a finger or some huge obscenity that you get along the way because they're going, we're trying to make a living. Because that thing, fishing, had changed. In the 40s, when my dad fished and he, he lived in his boat at 8th Street, they would fish five days a week for eight weeks. Yeah. And by the time the 70s came around, they'd fish one day a week, maybe two in a good year, for maybe 16 openings. Yeah. And now we have friends that fish once every second year for one day. You know, it's yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the role of the Port Patrol was mediating some of those conflicts as well. Yeah, trying to keep the traffic moving. Yeah. Uh, basically, also trying to be the on-the-ground eyes of what was happening in the port. Because mm-hmm. there wasn't the closed-circuit TV, there wasn't the radar links, there wasn't the real-time passing information back and forth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, if somebody had a, a, a scow, uh, Gulf of Georgia had a large, has a, or had a large tie-up at the Sapperton Middle Ground above the Patilla Bridge. Mm-hmm. And so we would monitor there from time to time because they had some barges that had been there for a very long time. And sometimes after a rain, they start listing back and forth so we would sound the barge and give uh, Gulf of Georgia a call saying, you better bring a pump up here before things sink. Yeah, yeah, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so this was an extension of the Harbour Master office? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. okay. Um, so, so you started there in uh, 1973. Na- 1973, yeah. you started yeah. on the river. Yeah. Um, and um, how long did you stay on the in the patrol? Till 1979, and uh, by then the uh, port authority was evolving um, to become uh, understand that it was in terms of economic development as well as terminal development. There was all these folks using the river up and down, but um, not paying any rent. And so part of the mandate for administering Crown land was to get a return for the use of the land. So I was the first property supervisor uh, for the Port Authority. And so I, I take great pride in having started the, the, the property department for the Fraser River Port Authority, or Harbor Commission in those days. The, uh, the, the challenge was, um, when I got the job, they said, you're the property supervisor. And I said, okay, what do I do? Well, you're going to process people's requests to occupy land, and you're going to chase down the rent of all the guys who are on the land. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, where's the information? Well, we have the Cardex. And the Cardex was a list of filing cards that gave a name, an address, uh, some kind of description, and a dollar amount. So I thought, oh, well, the description, that's the piece. So I said, there's maps. So I thought, oh, 
I'll just take the Cardex, I'll cross-index the maps, and that'll be great. The maps are 20 years old. The, car, the Cardexes were the last address they had. And so uh, with virtually no money, uh, my first job was trying to use the patrol boat to go out and ground truth who, where people were. And what we rapidly found was there was way more people than we had building cards for. And uh, that's where Say Their Boat Works comes back around. By the time my uh, godfather, my sister's godfather had sold the place to uh, a Japanese uh, boat builder, uh, I walked in. He'd, built, he'd bought a, uh, built a company that had been operating for 30 years. He'd operate it for 10, and I said, you need to pay rent. And he said, I'm paying my taxes. I said, no, no, because you occupy crown land, you're taxable, but you've got to pay rent to the feds. Well, why? Because you're occupying federal crown land. So? You're not paying the government. I never paid the government before. Why would I pay him now? I'm paying taxes. And in those days, as long as you paid tax, you didn't care whether it went to the feds or the province. You were paying something. Mm -hmm. So, it, so say the boat works was an example. It took me eight years to finally convince him to take a tenure uh, because I basically I said to him, "Look, without tenure, without an application of tenure, you can't get navigable waters protection approval." Mm -hmm. And he's going, "Why would I want that?" I said, if some sane boat comes along here and hits your dock and sinks and you haven't got NWPA, you're liable. Mm -hmm. And by the end, oh, okay, I throw my hands up and I give up. But I had to go to him every year and almost wring his arm to get the rent because even though he'd had it, he still wasn't going to pay it. <laughs> but it was always fun. Um, so. That uh, that position that you, yep. that you had when you, when, you, when you moved across, so was this... This was the first time that the Harbour Commission ever and, attempted to collect rent? No, they collected rent, but it was on an ad hoc basis. There was nobody actually assigned uh -huh. to, as I said, ground truth how many users there were and what they were getting. Yeah. The, the rent from the land was always seen as um, low-hanging fruit for net income. It wasn't pursued as a, a bit of business it is today. So the, the uh, PCT and uh, overseas, they would have paid rent? Well, no, that's interesting you should say that. So um, uh -huh. overseas, um, there was an operating agreement, and they would pay based on their throughput of tonnage. Okay? Um, but PCT was more interesting in that, remember, PCT was a uh, offshoot from Marathon Realty, which was owned by the CPR. And so that all sat on a huge crown grant that included the water lot for the dock. Didn't include the mooring strip, but included the dock. And um, so one of the things that came up in those days was uh, transport. Or Public Works Canada uh, was doing channel dredging in support of economic development. Mm -hmm. And so they would dredge uh, the main channels. Um, individuals, and that's how it is today, had to um, dredge whatever space they rented outside for themselves. And then uh, the approach channel between the terminal, or between the channel and your water lot, there'd be a 50-50 share with the government on how to get there. And that's how it worked for years or years and years. Um, and that's what stimulated the building of the trifurcation works in the river, where you see, and that's interesting too, uh, you see on the south side of the river that rock wall that goes roaring down. You see the flow splitter at the top of the north arm, and you think, oh, those are kind of outside New Westminster. But what you don't see is just about where, um, I keep saying Swiftshire, but it's now uh, Amex uh, Salvage and Towing. Mm -hmm. There are two um, submerged hydraulic structures that cause the, uh, the water to go up and then down and do a bit of erosion along the front of the docks mm -hmm. to keep the water moving down that way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a very complex, uh, fascinating piece of work done mm -hmm. back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, Sorry, I keep rambling around. This is just... No, 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 no that, that, that's okay. And so, so, um, so you, um, you, you, you were hired to try and bring some order to this. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I did. So after, um, from 1979, and uh, 86, I did develop a, uh, a base map. We did get to um, 
uh, tying. So one of the interesting things was when I got the survey maps that were 20 years old and went to try and plot where people were occupying, it seemed the distances were all kind of wonky. So when I asked uh, Vic Crockford, the land surveyor who put them together, why they were kind of funny, he said, well, this isn't really a survey. It's more of a pictorial representation. <laughs> and I went, really? So uh, for a few dollars, uh, as we developed the new set, mm -hmm. he would start making ties to get the distances across. Now, one of the un interesting parts is um, the Port Authority had used these lease maps along with the navigation charts as kind of the be-all, end-all to do channel development and planning. Uh, but when you start tying things together and you get more accuracy, um, the pieces that you've rented uh, that were 75 feet are still 75 feet deep. But the channel you thought was 200 feet wide, maybe it was 150 feet wide. <laughs> and so it became a real challenge to try and modify people's tenure, particularly if they built a structure out there. So uh, it, it, it was a fascinating six years putting together. Mm -hmm. But by 1986, uh, the port had grown its land holdings and as well as the administration of uh, rental and uh, applications, there was the issue of land development. So they brought in uh, Tom Corsi, who had been the deckhand on the boat behind me, uh, and he took over land development, and then I became the deputy harbor master in that Tom Grosier was going to leave a short while later, so I apprenticed with him as the harbor master and became the harbor master. When when you um, when you were working on the patrol, um, where did that um, where did that where did that tie up? Yeah, uh, so that's gosh, it takes a long question to get here. So where the hotel is uh, today and the office building, uh, Public Works Canada had a, a piece of land between. The, well, it's interesting um, where PCT is now and uh, where the Samson is. That's where the uh, Public Works had their uh, tie up facility. And what they did, that was a... Their where, where Smith is? No, no, no. Where the, basically the hotel and the office tower. Okay. That's a piece of land where Public Works Canada mm -hmm. was the owner. And what it was, was their south coast base of operations for all their uh, dock maintenance on the entire coast. Mm -hmm. So the Sokoa and the Essington would um, come there, load up with timbers and supplies, for their trips up the coast to repair the public wharfs all the way up to uh, uh, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And it was also where the Samson tied up. So where the Samson's tied up now is almost uh, where it was tied up uh, all those years it was working and pulling snags. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the Port Authority was able, because there was a very uh, close relationship between the Port Authority and Public Works Canada in those days, in that they both had a mandate for economic development. And it wasn't till many years down the road that I learned, and I think the Port Authority learned to their surprise, that Public Works Canada was actually working on the direction of Transport Canada, because we had actually never talked to Transport Canada. They were always seen as the guys who ran Coast Guard and were sort of outside the river or managed uh, outside the river, because uh, Public Works Canada used the Sokoa or the uh, part of the, the Samson to do all the buoy uh, monitoring and maintenance in the river. So it never clicked for us that they were actually working for somebody else. So in, uh, I think it was 1980, 80, 70, 80 um, the federal government uh, decided that they, uh, they had to improve their uh, accounting system. And so everything went to a cost accounting process where they had to issue purchase orders between departments and get money back. And suddenly Public Works Canada is backing up against the wall and saying, well, we sent them a bill, sent Transport Canada a bill for dredging. They don't want to pay it, so we've got to cut back the program. And everybody was scrambling to downsize. And um, I personally think Canada is a little the worse for the fact that the accountants got in charge rather than the empire builders that had been previously, which were about building land and building projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little bias there. <laughs> so you had you, you shared the public works dock, the tie up was mm -hmm. there. 
um, and um, and and you'd um, uh, so when, when you're on the patrol, you'd go there every morning, I presume, and and, and head out. Yep. Um, then when you when you moved into the property side of things, where were you working out of there? So a quick story on the patrol division first. Yeah. Okay. My wife liked the story. Um, We've been married about a month, and my wife, being, she finished teaching at three. She would often pick me up uh, down at the dock at, um, at, uh, at the foot of 10th Street. And um, I remember getting off the boat one day, and uh, now, sorry, as newlyweds, like every good dewy-eyed newlywed, we had plans of going to Europe. We had plans of a little house with a white picket fence. We had plans for travel. Anyway, about a month into our marriage, I get off the boat, I, it was low tide, so I look up the gangway, and there in the pier head is my bride, looking a little disheveled. And I thought, hmm, that's odd. As I got a bit closer, I noticed when she buttoned her sweater up, she was one button out. And I thought, that's very odd. So I get to the top and say, you okay? She says, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? She says, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, what? <laughs> we had like a three-year game plan. <laughs> so... A little aside here, we've been married 40 years now, and for our 40th anniversary, we sat down uh, to calculate how many, you know, how much time we'd had alone without kids and visitors and stuff. And we think in 40 years, we've lived independently, the two of us, for about 40 months, <laughs> nine of which was at the front of our marriage. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. That's great. Peter's wondering and, where all this is going. And, you, <laughs> and, and always in New Westminster. Yep, and it's, a, it's so interesting. Fourth Street. Fourth Street uh, okay, well, we, I was born on Ewan Avenue. Yeah. Uh, we got married. We had an apartment at the corner of 7th Street and 4th Avenue. Okay. Our first house was on Wilson Street in Sapperton. Uh -huh. There's some interesting stories over there. And then we bought uh, when our, uh, our uh, uh, third child was born. Uh, on 7th Avenue, on the 400, 300 block where we are now. Okay. And um, about 1984, uh, we thought, oh, it's time to uh, get to a bigger accommodations again. And by then, um, people were really looking at the valley. And uh, so we were looking at Coquitlam, and we were looking at Pitt Meadows and Maple Ridge. And my wife, the voice of reason, uh, kept saying, but I don't want to commute long distances. I don't want to cross bridges. And we kind of looked around and we said, did the, the pluses and minuses. And uh, in our location, uh, we're on the, a bit of the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. So it's not like downhill, uphill. And uh, from our location on uh, 7th Avenue, it is uh, three short blocks to the pool, three short block blocks and a little bit to the ice rink, uh, two blocks to what was in Woodward's, uh, two blocks to Linden Drugs. And we kind of thought, the hell would we move? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so strangely, in New West, um, our neighbors, we, like, it was so funny, we moved in, and everyone's going, oh, some young people, isn't that nice? Because <laughs> everyone around us was retired. But um, my own family legend is, there's something in the air on 7th Avenue that's worth keeping. Mm -hmm. The lady uh, to the west of us, uh, lived in her home and died at 92 in her sleep. The man on the east of us uh, lived independently till he was about 98, went to George Derby, lasted two more years. Uh, the lady kitty corner from us lived in her own home till she was 94 and went to a home. Uh, the man across the street um, made it till he was about in the mid 80s. Unfortunately, when he passed away, he was sitting in his rocker in the front window and we didn't actually know he was dead for about four days till somebody said, have you seen Jack move? No. <laughs> yeah. And then Kitty Corner to that, um, Willie just passed away and she was in her high 90s. And so all of our neighbors have had very long longevity and many of the people on our street mm -hmm. have. And so we kind of think that close proximity causes people to get out and walk a little bit. And um, we're going to stay there mm -hmm. as long as we can. Yeah. Okay. 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 Babble, 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 babble. Well, that's great. <laughs> So, 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 um, so yeah. come, come yeah. to, uh, yeah, come, come to, where, where did you work in the office when you, when you, when uh, oh, you sorry. came to okay. the um, no. At um, the fifth floor of the Westminster building. And it's interesting, the port had been there, I think, uh, since the 30s or 40s. And uh, we, when I moved, when I first started there, 
Um, again, the, the, the Harbor Commission was slow to move because you have to remember in uh, 1904 when the federal government and the provincial government negotiated the, uh, the, harbor, the Six Harbors Agreement and determined that there were federal harbors within British Columbia, that then led to the creation of harbor boards, federal agencies to do economic development. So um, when I got to the office in uh, 1973, right up till 1979, the glass, if you remember the, the old mahogany doors with the vertical uh, textured glass, it said harbor board. And the whole time I worked in that space, old folks would come in and going, okay, and so when we renovated, we changed to the Harbor Commission, they're going, where the hell's the Harbor Board? And out on the field, I don't think until 1990, any of the users called it the Harbor Commission. It was always the Harbor Board. Really? <laughs> yeah, it was remarkable. They, uh, it, people would, would uh, deal with the Harbor Board at a distance, via the mail. They would send in mm. their, uh, their check, or I would go out and talk to them in their homes about getting the, uh, their uh, applications done. Uh, very few people came through the door. It was quite interesting. The pe most people who came through the door were, um, was one of the uh, commissioners in those days um, had a legal firm and the port, because it was rich, could afford to buy the, uh, the, the old directories. Remember those directories that had people's and names and businesses and you could find out before computers? Mm -hmm. And so his assistant would come in every day, pull down the directory to chase one of his clients because he couldn't afford to buy the directory. And then at the end of the year, uh, the local pilots who had an office uh, in on this third floor would come up and take the last previous year's Lloyd Registry because they couldn't afford to buy the Lloyd's Register to get the information on the ships they were moving. So... so um you, I mean, you just said everyone talked about it as the as the harbor board, board yeah. as the harbor board, um, but um, but you know some some people make a distinction of the fact that New West had a commission and Vancouver didn't. Vancouver was a a different kind of kettle of fish. You got to put that in perspective. Yeah. Um, so have you got time for a bit of a story? Sure. Ten minutes worth. Um, originally, there was only harbor boards. And so in, in 1905, six, uh, Vancouver applied to Ottawa for a harbor board. Mm -hmm. uh, New Westminster applied for a harbor board. The city of Marpole applied for a harbor board. Remember that Marpole wasn't part of Vancouver in those mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. And so all of those were granted. And so you had the New Westminster Harbor Board, the Marpole Harbor Board, and the Vancouver Harbor Board. And that progressed until the 1930s. Mm -hmm. The and this is where I have I, I probably speak with too much vanity, but the Vancouver Harbor Board went bankrupt. Marpole didn't, and the Fraser River didn't. Now, strangely enough, um, Montreal went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Halifax went bankrupt. St. John, New Brunswick went bankrupt. St. John's, Newfoundland went bankrupt. And so to salvage these federal assets, the federal government created the National Harbors Board, which pulled it together, and then they had one harbor, one board of directors in Ottawa that sent directions out to the, the general managers in each port. Because they were so close to Transport Canada, somehow um, the people in Ottawa thought, well, these are... Canada's big ports. These are Canada's important ports. They kind of quickly lost the fact that they had been poor businessmen and had gone bankrupt. But because they were close to home and controlled from Ottawa, in the 60s, you'll see advertising. And it's Canada's ports, the key to your future. And it's a key ring, with one key being Vancouver, one key being Prince Rupert, and Port Alberni, and uh, Port Nanaimo, and North Fraser, and Fraser River weren't anywhere to be seen because they were at arm's length. So as time went on, you have to remember that the Fraser River uh, Harbor Commission, because it changed in 1964 when they repealed the Harbor Board Act and created the Harbor Commissions Act, that um, New Westminster had a remarkable autonomy. So when Fraser Surrey was built, 
the two Paseco container cranes that were erected on the terminal were the first container cranes in West Canada. Nobody in Vancouver will talk about that. Um, and theirs only came after they made submissions to Ottawa to get it. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until, I think, um, the um, Canada Ports Act in the 80s that Vancouver actually had its own board of directors domiciled in Vancouver to give you corporation. Sorry, thank you. And so, you know, I, I take a lot of pride in the fact that um, New Westminster is small, um, but it has been home to some very big thinkers who, who acted in the best interest of the country. It's one of the things that my wife, I think, probably thinks I'm a bit crazy, but when you worked for a harbor commission, it was always about economic growth. It was about being uh, in support of the national dream and our legends were always around look at the CPR look at the St. Lawrence these are the way that Canada stays a trading nation and I developed a love of this country in a way that I don't think many people have the opportunity particularly when you get to travel with the association to every port in the country and see how they're all different but they're all working in the same direction and my wife was always disappointed in that the international travel always went to those high on the feeding chain, and um, the domestic travel, the, so the American travel, sort of went to the next level. And uh, I would end up in Thunder Bay and and St. John's, New Brunswick, or Nova, Nova, Newfoundland, and um, she would kind of go, "What are you doing?" I'm saying, "You have no idea how amazing these places are." And so as I was, I was trying, and so. When I was working, my kids, I would take them on tri trips to see these places. And when she got into retirement, we made a few trips before she retired. Time to go, I'm almost like, oh, yeah, at least we're almost done. So, uh, but um, it really does, has given me the ability to see the width and breadth of this country. And so our bucket list now is to uh, visit something north of 60 to be able to see the whole country. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry, I've taken so much time. And that That's great. Um, <laughs> um, I, I want to capture one, two things before okay. while we yep. watch them, uh, <laughs> and maybe we'll come back to them. You said the Harbour Commission was rich, or it had money. It had money because it could keep it. So it the money it generated stayed here, unlike the bank, which we had to go to Van, to Ottawa, yeah, and and un, and unlike some local lawyer yeah. kind of thing. So and the other thing is, we could take mortgages, and that's how Fraser Surrey got built. Mm -hmm. We did a $21 million mortgage with the Toronto Dominion Bank right uh, next door, well, was next door where Mr. Wang, Wang is now, was the Toronto Dominion Bank. And uh, that's how Fraser Surrey got going. That's how the cranes got built with a mortgage. Is it fair to say you had, you, you kind of, you, you had the best of both worlds? You kept your revenue, you could take mortgages, yeah. and you didn't have to pay for the dredging, you didn't have to. And we didn't pay property tax because we were exempt. Yeah. And I guess the beauty was, I think, we were entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. We weren't burdened by government bureaucrats complying with government policy, with structures around the budget. We were free to go. And I think something is lost in this country when you can't do that anymore. Um, and then the other, the other just comeback thing, and I definitely think we want to pick up this one later, is uh, right at the beginning, you'd, you spent some time working on the dock in the summer, Mm -hmm. uh, in the summers, you were you, you were in the PCT, mm -hmm. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, did it ever? Did it, it? And and then and then you went away to go and study. You came back to work on the patrol boat. Yep. Did it ever occur to you at that moment, at, during that time period? Okay, I, I I should have gone to the hiring hall. I went to the PCT by mistake. I could have gone. You know, I could have gone to ships. I could have. Did it ever occur to you to try something different at that point, or or you know what? Strangely, it didn't. It, it, it was like a predestiny yeah. that was going to lead me here no matter what I did. Okay. It was strange. Um, I, I, the, the, the Port Authority and myself just seemed made for each other. It was uh, strange. I, I was very proud of the fact that uh, up until uh, 2008, I'd never applied for a job in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and yet I'd, I'd set up, so I'd gone from the deckhand to the CEO, 
and never filled out a piece of paper. And I was a bit horrified when an effort to become more business-like, we developed applica- you know, employment application forms and, and talked about background screening. But then I also had some great people working with me who talked about rather than hiring for their education degree, their experience, or their in professional des- designation, we're a group of 35 people. Let's think about building a team and hire folks for their leadership, their self-starting, their communication ability. And so just before amalgamation, we'd finished a four-year program of leadership training, and that's why we went into amalgamation. I was convinced the Fraser River Harbor or Port Authority folks could compete in a level playing field because we'd developed some entrepreneurship, we'd given them skills. As it turned out, they quickly left the amalgamated port, which was remarkably bureaucratic, and ended up in great jobs all around. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Anyway. Okay, so this this has been great. Uh, we, we, we do need to uh, allow the next users mm-hmm. in, but uh, I look forward to continuing this. So Thanks, I'm going to turn this off. Thank you.